the Lord this morning. Yes. It's beautiful out. It's a great. It's always a great day to worship the Lord, but it just makes it so much better when it's sunny too. I don't know. But it's good to be here in the house of the Lord. Before we get started, I have a couple of announcements to make. If you look inside your bulletins, you see that this evening we're planning on taking the van out to see Hope at uh, Gardens Way. And what the plan is, is just to sing a couple songs there for uh, the residents there and just have a time of fellowship with Hope. So if you would like to come, the van is going to be leaving at 545. So try to get here 544, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, also the pageants are, are going to be performing in concert here. And that's going to be on April 28th at 6 p.m. And there will be some light refreshments to follow. So ladies, and I shouldn't say just ladies only, but gentlemen, uh, you might be getting a phone call or I'm not sure how they're going to do it, but baking some cookies or baking some carrots and celery. How do you do that? <laughs> The Pagets is a Southern Gospel group. It's a father and son duo. Um, they actually, they sound pretty good. I like, I like to listen to them when I was looking at their uh, YouTube videos. But it's a father and son duo. They do a Southern Gospel style singing. So um, I think you'll like, you'll appreciate the, their spirit and their, their, their testimony that they have. So thanks for that. Um, also, just mark on your calendars, May 17th, 18th, and 19th. The spring revival service. We're going to have it with Brother Lane Loman. Uh, so just be in prepare, or pre preparation for that. Be in prayer for that as well as we're preparing for that. And uh, see, you know, invite some individuals to that as well. Also then, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our... Never mind. Mike, go ahead. I was going to come up with something, but I won't do that. Go ahead, Mike. I'm going to stay out of trouble. Just real quick, those of you... They're signed up for the Sight and Sound trip in June 19th and 20th. We're going to have a brief meeting right after church in the library for all the updates and awesome. costs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other announcements that need to be made? All right. Would you stay with me as we open with the word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. Father, we thank you for the sunshine this morning and the warmth that it brings. And Father, we just come before you right now and thank you that we can gather here freely to worship you. And Father, we come here to worship you. We come here to praise you. And Father, we come here to hear what your Holy Spirit has to say to us. Father, I ask that you just continue to prepare our hearts. Father, that you would help us to stay focused and, and not be distracted by what's going on outside of here. But Father, help us to stay focused on you, Father, because you are worthy to be praised. We love you and we praise you and we ask all this in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. You may be seated. And at this time, just continue to prepare yourselves for worship as we listen to this song. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. What a such a beautiful song. Such a beautiful song. Grace greater than our sin. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Man, it's so beautiful. Um, I'm so grateful for that grace in my life. Um, for sure. I'm sure a lot of people can stand up and say the same thing this morning. It's good to see everybody here. Like Luke said, and boy, it's the sunshine. It's so beautiful outside. I was outside in the back patio for a little bit this morning enjoying the sun, and then I started uh, ruining my mood because I looked at the forecast, and it's supposed to get kind of lousy this afternoon. So I put my phone away and enjoyed the sun a little bit more. So um, <laughs> This morning's call to worship comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 145, verse 21. Let's read that together, if we would. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and the flesh shall bless Him, His holy name. Amen. Amen. If you're using your hymn books this morning, let's turn to page 209. Page 209. This is the day. <coughs>
voices this morning. Let's turn to page 517. Page 517. Another one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites, so I kind of say that every week, I think. <laughs>
You're going to also notice as you put them together, Lori's not here. <laughs> so, you're probably thinking you're going to speak to did she hit him? And he's not charged, and she in jail. Okay? Well, the truth is, I just didn't doubt her coming from something. So, so you can getting squelch those rumors. Okay? Um, Tim, would you ask the question in the office? Dear Father, thank you for this Sunday morning. And, uh, we have them here in the Lord's name. Thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us in this church. Now you're supporting back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. surgery, ended up having another surgery, 
as well, and then had uh, infection and sepsis and uh, succumbed to the sepsis. So let's just remember the Sanford family. We also just want to continue to remember Karen Gatsby. She's uh, been fighting the infection. Uh, and it seems like the infection was getting worse, and it's just, it's really, it's really hitting her hard. Uh, not only physically, but just emotionally. It, she, she's, she's a servant of the Lord, she likes to be out, uh, and she helps lead a, 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 an inspirational time, a Bible study, and uh, it's just, she wants to be there. So let's just pray for Karen as well. <laughs> let's remember Kim, uh, Rob Watson's mother. She had the heart attack, and the doctors say that there's nothing more that they can do. They've done all that they can. And so they're leaving. It, it, it sounds like the doctors are saying it's only a matter of time. And so we want to be praying for Rob and, and Kim's family uh, during this time, that they would have wisdom and peace and comfort. Let's also just continue to remember uh, Alice. She's going to be having surgery on the 22nd, which is Monday. So something to that she's been looking forward to for a long time but uh, we just want to remember alice that there would be no complications with that surgery and gerald as well that uh god just give them peace and comfort and strength when the time comes and then just an update on shana shana is doing very well still down at the hospital um still going to have a couple weeks before she can come home possibly even will be in a transitional care facility but we just want to continue to pray for Shane. But they're giving God the glory for how he's worked with that little one with the heart transplant. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to ask prayer for my father. He was doing good, was. Uh, and then he started declining again on Friday. And so we ended up having to take him down to West Penn. And so he's currently in the hospital, uh, received some blood transfusion. Just saying, kind of the same thing, the, the blood's just deteriorating. Uh, so he's currently still down at West Penn. Uh, just the doctors, they don't know what to do. Uh, they're pulling in all these specialists and everything. So just just, just pray for my father and my mother. Uh, just the safety while they're traveling. My mom's traveling and just strength as well. But uh, are there any other prayer requests or update that would like to be mentioned? Yes, Shay. Uh, Chuck and Doris for, yes. uh, have been separated. She's in <coughs> And at this time, would you please stand with me as we take these to the Lord in prayer? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And Father, we thank you that you're a God who loves us, that you're a God who is full of mercy and grace. And Father, that you've sent your Son to die on the cross for us, and the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Father, we just come before you and we thank you and praise you for how you've been moving in our church, how you've been moving in our lives, how you've been moving in some of these prayer requests. Father, we praise you and thank you for the good report and that Nancy is able to be with us here again this morning. 
we thank you for that, Father, how there is no complications and how she just felt your presence the whole way. Father, we thank you for how you've been working with Shana in that little one's life. We praise you and thank you for that. And Father, right now, we just come before you and lift up. You see all these ones that are going to be having additional testing coming up. And Father, uh, we, we know that sometimes there can be some anxieties that are brought up about it. And Father, we just give them to you and ask that you have your way in each and every one of these ones that are going to have further testings. Father, we also just lift up to you these ones that are suffering from cancer. Father, I just ask, especially, we think of Rob right now. I know he's been very low with the cancer, but now that they found a spot on his spine, God, I just pray that you be with him. Father, help him to just lean upon you. Father, I just pray that you be with his, with his father as well as he's going to have surgery on the 29th. God, I pray that there would be no complications and that through this, you would be glorified in it, Father. We just ask this. Father, we also just lift up Alice to you. You see the surgery that she has coming up. I just ask that you would have your perfect way, no complications, and Father, that everything will go according to your plan, and that there be a peace about the situation. Father, we think of uh, Karen Gadsby right now as well, with the leg infection that she has. Father, she has a desire to be back, uh, back in the Bible study and leading, and, and a desire to be out working. Well, Father, I pray that you would just be with this one. Father, that you would just give the doctors and nurses wisdom as they work with this infection. And Father, I pray that you would just touch her leg and remove the infection, help the healing to take place. And Father, give her strength. May she just sense your spirit abiding with her in the room that she's in. Father, I just pray that once again you would have your way. Father, we lift up these ones that are going through the loss of a loved one. Father, we think of Casey, we think of uh, the DeMarco family, we think of the Sanford family. Father, you see all these ones that have lost a loved one. And Father, I just pray that they would turn to you, that you would just give them the comfort that they need, the strength that they need to carry on, Father, and the peace that only you can give. Father, we also just we lift up those that are dealing with depression. Father, in, in this time of stay, in this, in this day, Father, as, as things, when we look around us, we do see that there's so much darkness. And Father, I can understand how they would be depressed. And Father, right now, I just lift up our loved ones to you that are going through depression. Father, I lift up our loved ones that aren't walking in a right relationship with you. Father, we're always quick to pray for the physical. Father, I pray for the spiritual. Father, if anything, I pray for the spiritual. That their, that their spiritual needs would be met. That their, the walls of their heart would be broken down. That they would be softened. That, and that they would respond to the knock on their heart's door. Father, I pray that you would just continue to send the right people across their path, that they would just be able to speak your words to them, and that they would hear exactly what they need to hear to realize that they're in a lost situation, that they need you. Father, I pray this, that you would have your way in their lives. God, we also just lift up our church to you. Father, I thank you for what you've been doing within our church. God, I pray that you just continue to guide our church. Father, as, as we prepare for the spring revival coming up, God, I just pray that you'd help us. We don't have to wait till May for a revival to hit, to start. We could A revival could start right here, right now. Father, I just pray that you would just help us examine ourselves and see if there's anything that we need to continue to surrender to you, Father. I just pray that you would have your way in our church, in our personal lives, Father, in our community. Father, we think of the nation. God, and we just ask that you be with our nation. Father, one, that you put a hedge protection around those who are in leadership that are serving you. Father, that you keep them safe and embolden them. But Father, also we now pray and ask that you put people into positions of leadership that serve you, that fear you. God, I just pray that there would be no compromise. But Father, I pray that there would be righteous individuals that, that are serving you wholeheartedly in those positions. Father, we think of the conflicts going on over in Israel right now and with Iran. God, I pray that the eyes of the world leaders would be open up and that you would have your way over in that, situ uh, over in that region, Father. That in that situation, you would be glorified in it. Father, I just pray that you would please have your way. God, we just come before you now and we give the rest of this service to you. 
Father, we lift up those who have unspoken requests. You know them. And Father, I just pray that you would have your way in those unspoken needs. And Father, have your way in our hearts this morning. Just help us to hear from your Holy Spirit. We love you and we praise you. And we give all these other requests to you as well. In Jesus' heavenly name, amen. You may be seated. Things seem to be 
be falling in disarray. <coughs> Our Redeemer is with us. He's with us every step of the way. I, I keep on, I mean, thinking of my, my father and the situation he's in. My mom and I, we're, we're, we're just in my family. We're just, okay, God, you're going to have your way. You're going to have your way. Um, thinking of the folks and the situation that they're in, there seems to be a lot of chaos. But we're going to have to pray and trust God that he's going to set order to it. I have to mention, we've been going through a, uh, we've been doing the membership class. And uh, Thursday, yeah, Thursday was, was awesome. Uh, we, had, we had a time where we were just finishing up a little bit. And then every one of us went around and just shared our testimony. And I tell you what, when you start sharing testimonies, there's power in just sharing testimonies. Because all of a sudden you just start feeling that Holy Spirit, that, that fire burning inside you of, wow, okay, yep, I'm not alone. Or wow, God, look what God did for them. Now let me share what God did for me. And it just, it's one of those, it just, kind of like a cheerleader, I guess you could say, in a way, when we start sharing testimonies of what God has done. So that's a come on Sundays. You're always going to hear me. Does anyone have a, a testimony or a praise? Too bad if you get tired of hearing it. I'm just going to keep on asking for it. And you can even interrupt me anytime. See, you can interrupt. Yes, go ahead. And the main thing, we all felt comfortable with that meeting. Yes. Uh, telling our testimony. We felt comfortable. I think everybody did. I know I did. When you're in fellowship with one another, you know, in the, in the house, if, if you can't, if you don't feel the love of God, well, we just need to have an altar call then <laughs> for everyone. But uh, it is, it's definitely true when you're in fellowship with one another in the presence of Jehovah. Any other praises or testimonies? when they think of going to prison. Yeah, why would I want an individual to go to prison? Yeah. When you're in prison, you, there's not much that you do that you have available. And so oftentimes, actually, 
ministry can take off like wildfire because they don't have anything else to do, so they'll read the Bible. I mean, granted, they can work out, they have TV and stuff like that. But there was a, a case, I think it was in a maximum security prison down in Louisiana. I can't remember the name. But the, the warden, the superintendent uh, that came in was a Christian. And this, this maximum security was full of violence, full of drugs, even within the prison. And uh, the maximum security, uh, the, the warden decided to introduce them into a Bible study. Uh, I believe it was called Experiencing God. And through that Bible study, all of a sudden, a little bit of a revival kind of took place. Now, it was still prison, but, and it wasn't for everyone, but the, a lot of men came to knowing Christ through that Bible study. And all of a sudden, the, the, the crazy violence that was going on, the drugs, started to taper down. And the funny thing is, other wardens started to notice this, and they're like, how are you doing this? How are you, how, how's this violence decreasing? How, what's going on here? And he just said, hey, I'm, I, this is what we're doing. We just introduced this Bible study. And so all of a sudden, then, what they started doing is they started asking for transfers of their, uh, their, their modeled inmates. Hey, can you, can you send a couple of your inmates over here that, they would, that way they can start you know, doing a study here? And so even through the prison system, they were able to get a little bit of a revival in the study going. And it's just amazing. You don't think of that in prison. You don't think of a prison as a place where a revival could take place. But the thing is, you got to keep your eyes open for wherever God is working. And wherever God is working, that's what you start praying for. And that's what was happening in those prison systems. So it, it's, it's encouraging. It's encouraging. Last week when uh, Dr. Sillings was speaking, um, he said something that uh, really spoke to me. Um, he was talking about, uh, and as long as he's done his job, he said, uh, he, was, he was kind of going through his insecurities, saying things like, you know, maybe I should just step aside and let somebody else do this that knows what they're doing. Um, and when he said that, I just, it was almost like somebody punched me in the face. And I thought, wait, did he just say what I thought he said? Because um, to have that humility, to be able to uh, freely admit that, but also, um, it, it spoke a lot to me um, as far as his heart and his attitude uh, towards what he's doing. Um, also, it shows uh, when you have those feelings of maybe I should just step aside and somebody do it, uh, God just steps in and says, no, you're the person I picked to do this. Um, and for me personally, uh, uh, there is, there's not too many things I do that I don't say the same things as myself is what he was saying like, man you're 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 messed up why don't you let somebody else just step in and do it you know, maybe do a better job but, um, but that's the Holy Spirit working uh, last week and not just in that sermon but I mean for me personally the Holy Spirit was really working there speaking to me about you know the devil's going to throw up interference Randy and I uh, were texting a little bit back and forth and telling me about that and um uh, just when you feel like you have things kind of going better in your spiritual life or your devotional life or your prayer life, that wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to sit by idly and just let it go. <clears throat> and um, I, just, I just feel like him saying that last week just spoke volumes to me. And I don't know if, if anybody else really thought of it or if it spoke to anybody like that, but I'm just so appreciative of that. And, Pray if you have those feelings of like let somebody else do it. Don't don't have those feelings. I think we need to do to do what you're doing. So you know, just do it and be blessed and, and serve the Lord and be blessed. Amen. Amen. Any others? <laughs> so if you figured out, oh yes. I'm glad that my Redeemer is faithful and true. Amen. Man, oh man, that really touched my heart. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought about the fact that very God, whenever we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, <clears throat> I think he devised a plan of salvation. Somebody didn't devise it and then tell him to carry it out. 
He's the one that figured it out, and then he carried it out. Yes. He is faithful and true. And the reason he did it, we all know, I guess we do, that he didn't do it for himself. He did it for us. Yes. And I'm so grateful for that. Yes. In my heart, I, am, I love him, I worship him, and I praise his holy name. Amen. See, when I say we're going, we can praise and testify, feel free to interrupt any time. Well, the devil's telling me to stay seated. Uh, I'm thankful we talked Thursday night <clears throat> that I was raised in this church. Didn't know it's agree with it, and neither did my backside, but I'm thankful for the, the preaching and parents that cared. And that front pew was theirs every Sunday for the, my entire life, <clears throat> almost, uh, being raised. And I'm so thankful that every time I thought I could do this and get away with it or do that and get away with it, there was a little tug. You know, Dad and Mom ain't going to appreciate that, and the God's watching whether they're here or not. Yeah. You know? And um, I'm just thankful that I was raised the way I was raised. And I'm thankful for the life I have now on my wife. And I just pray this holy name. Amen. 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 I can almost echo that too. <clears throat> and there's times where I was like, disagreed with the parents about stuff, but yet looking back, Thankful. Well, feel free to interrupt me any time if the Holy Spirit's laying something on your heart. Because I'm just man. I'm not, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Pray, let the Holy Spirit speak through me. But feel free if any time the Holy Spirit's speaking. Feel free. Last week, sadly, our projector was not working. But uh, we got it working. And I wanted to show a couple of pictures real quick that Dr. Sillings was going to show. Uh, so this is uh, Brother Joe, who was here last summer, is laboring in Nigeria. And I'm hoping that the clicker is going to work. There we go. This is the Ugame State Church. This is the congregation that we sent the money over to help build the church. This is a picture of the congregation we're helping out, literally. And so I thought this was real neat to see this photo. Um, we also have some pictures of, this is them laying the, the cornerstone of the church that we're building. Uh, well, not that we're building, but that we helped out. Um, I really wish I could go over there and take a couple uh, over there to help build, but not yet. So we'll, we'll go over there eventually. But they're just, they're just squaring it up, laying it down. You can see how big it is and the footers that they're working on. It's, just, it's pretty neat to see that even though we are halfway around the world, the impact that we can have with the help of God. And so we're praying, we want to be praying for this, this group. Um, as you recall, Dr. Sealing said that inflation hit big time. Uh, things are almost now three or four times the cost of what it should be. I think there's more on the wall. I just repeat it. There we go. That's how tall it is now. You can see they got the walls up. And is there one more? Yeah, another video. Oh. Well, that, that was another video right there. Yep, yeah, of uh, the Ugame State Building. So the, the the church that they're building, and that's as of April sixth, two thousand twenty-four. So that was just a couple weeks last week. So that's pretty neat to see. Pretty neat to see how God's moving. Well, um, Marilyn, I apologize. You might have to be doing clicking. Yeah. Let me see. So, redeemed by ransom. Redeemed by the ransom. That's what all the songs that we were talking about was redeemed. We're talking about our Redeemer and a ransom. And sometimes when we start talking about redeem and ransom, sometimes they can kind of run together. They're related. But this morning, I'm going to kind of tease them apart just a little bit. And, and it's something, we just got done celebrating Easter, which is the resurrection. 
of Christ. And, and right now, if, if it was biblical times, you know, we're a couple weeks after Easter, Christ is still walking around conversing with individuals. But what I want to look about today is redeemed by the ransom. So first off, I want us to kind of define the two terms. Redeemed versus ransom. So redeem, we understand this, the action of being, uh, the action of buying back. And we're, we're familiar with this term, uh, especially for those of you who think I'm going to go to Ruth, I'm not. Okay? But that's what we usually think about is the kinsman redeemer. The one who will go and, and purchase back from either slavery or, or if there was a death in the family, go and redeem. Bring them out of a state of suffering and buy them back. Bring them back in. So that's redeem. But now ransom is a little bit different. It, it still goes hand in hand. But what the ransom is, is the price paid for redemption. So redeem is like the action, the verb of doing something, and the ransom is the noun, what it's done. So the price paid for the redemption. I want us to focus on two stories real quick, and, and we'll, we'll probably move through this fairly quick. I know by looking at your notes, you're looking at all the scripture. No, that's just in there for extra, for homework that you guys can look at when you get home. But when we're looking at this, I want us to look at the redeemed from Egypt. So... I'm going, eh, it's, man, we got to work on that. So, redeemed from Egypt, we know the story of Joseph. We know the story of how Joseph was put into slavery, went into Egypt, how he became second in command and was preparing Egypt for the famine, and how his brothers came, got the food, and then all of his family, all of Joseph's family, his father, his brothers, their wives, their children, all moved into Egypt. When we first get into Exodus chapter 1, you start reading about the suffering and captivity that the Israelites did, that, that Joseph's family now did. You see, what happened is, all of a sudden, while they were in Egypt, they started prospering and multiplying and became a multitude of people, strong people. And the Egyptian, uh, the, the Pharaoh at the time, was concerned. He said, Man, if there's an enemy that comes against us, these Israelites might join them and, and, and attack us and overthrow us. So what he started doing is, basically, he turned them into slaves and had taskmasters, and, and they were to make brick and mortar. And so he, he put a heavy burden on them. And so, in a way, they went from sojourning in Egypt to all of a sudden now being captive in Egypt. And that was found in Exodus chapter 1. But what we find out is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, we see that the people started crying out to the Lord. The Lord wasn't far away from them. The Lord was not far away from them at all. He heard their cry because in Exodus 3, verse 7, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. This is God speaking to Moses at the burning bush. This is when God said, Moses, I need you to go to, or go to Egypt. I need you to go to Egypt and let my, lead my people out. For I've heard their cry. I've, I've, I've felt their burden. It was a redemption plan that was going to occur. And then here in Exodus 6.6, 6, we see this promised redemption coming to fruition. We see here in Exodus 6.6 6, where it says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, this is once again God speaking most, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Marilyn, if you can go ahead and just click that whole slide so that verse pops up, that'd be great. Um, sorry for the way that the clicker's not working. But if you look at the last verse on this slide, where it's Exodus 6.6, 6, it says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. 
Remember, I said ransom is the price that is paid for redemption. So at this point, we have Israel who's enslaved to Egypt. They're, they're, they're in need of redemption. They're in need of being bought free, set free. And the price that was paid, oftentimes we think of a sacrificial price that was paid. Well, if you look at this, this word with, I, I, I made it bold. This word with tells you exactly what the plan was of God, what was going to be the ransom to help free the children of Israel, how the children of Israel were going to be redeemed. Well, the ransom was going to be an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Those great judgments we know as the plagues. So it was at the cost of the Egyptians. The Egyptians all of a sudden became the ransom at that point to help free the Israelites from Egypt. And we know this story. We know God sent the plagues. We know God sent the ten plagues. And then finally the last plague, the claiming of the firstborn of every livestock, of every man that did not have the blood applied to their, their, their doorposts was taken. And that freed, finally, the Egyptians were saying, no, go, go, go. And the Israelites were able to walk free, get out free. You see, the Proverbs 21, 18 says, the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. And that's what God was doing in this case. There was a need of redemption. They were enslaved. Not necessarily by their own doing. I mean, some would argue, well, the forefathers should never have moved there to begin with. That's part of God's plan, because there was a famine. So there was a need to be redeemed out of the Egyptian captivity. <laughs> There was another redemption, another redemption that occurred, and it was redeemed from the exile. Here, after all the kings, we had King David, King Solomon, and then we had the split with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, right? The northern tribe, the southern tribe. And we know that the leadership of the Israelites in Judah just kept on drifting farther and farther and farther away from God to where Israel, the northern kingdom, was originally taken into captivity first. But then in the southern kingdom, we read in 2 Kings, in the chapter all, all of chapter 24, I'm not going to read it, but it was when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came in and overthrew Jehoiakim because they kept on transgressing God's law. It was a form of judgment. It was a form of discipline. So it was their transgressions now that they were taken into captivity. So Judah went into captivity because of their transgressions. And Jerusalem was fallen. This is part of the exile. This is part of what Daniel was, uh, was speaking part of. This is what uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah what they were prophesying against. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he kept on he kept on warning. He kept on warning but yet, we know that no one was going to listen to Jeremiah. God told them. They kept on warning. But yet, Israel did not, excuse me, Judah did not uh, repent. And they kept on their way. So what happened is Judah went into captivity. But yet, we hear where Ezekiel prophesied and, and God was going to hear their cry. Because God says, turn from your evil ways. Here in Ezekiel 33, 10 through 11, it says, Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away or waste away in them, how can we then live? What, what Israel is saying, if, if what you're saying, and if our transgressions are against us, there's no hope for us. There's no hope for us. We're going to waste away. Verse 11 says, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? They were acknowledging, okay, we have this sin. Well, how, what can we do? What can we do? Help us. We're, we're in a troubled place. 
He God mentioned and said to them, turn from your evil ways, turn from your wicked ways. You see, this verse is very specific. There, a lot of times, a lot of individuals like to point to the judgment of God. And, and God says, the wicked I abhor, right? We, we hear the verses of the wicked being judged. And, and so sometimes as Christians, sometimes we get that taste and we get what we call like that righteous anger or, or we, we, we're like, should we say, look at what's going on in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. And we can maybe have a little bit of a anger. Mm -hmm. But yet, what does it say here in Ezekiel 33, 11? <laughs> I have no pleasure in the wicked or in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way to live. See, God doesn't enjoy sending people to hell. He doesn't want to send people to hell. He doesn't enjoy the death of the wicked. He wishes instead that all would come to know him and all would be in a right relationship with him. Sometimes we tend to forget that. But God was going to hear the cry. And God was going to deliver them. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied 70 years you're going to be in captivity. <clears throat> and there is this promised redemption that we read of in Jeremiah 16, 14 through 15. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, as the Lord says, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. That's a, that's a throwback, a, a recall of being, being a captive in Egypt, right? And when Jesus, or excuse me, when God redeemed the Israelites from Egypt by the ransom of Egypt, by, by the plagues. That's what it says. But he says here, No longer will it be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them, for I will bring them back into their land which I gave their fathers. He was saying, I'm going to bring you back. Yes, you're in exile right now. Judah, you're in captivity. Northern tribe, you're in captivity. But I am going to bring you all back to the land of your fathers. I am going to bring you back. I'm going to redeem you. And again in Isaiah 43. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So just like when he redeemed Israel from Egypt, the ransom was at the cost of the Egyptians. So this time when they're in exile at Babylon, the cost of their ransom was actually the Babylonian kingdom. And we read about this, we can read and see this unfold if you read in Daniel. If you recall, one of the, the stories I loved as a kid growing up was the handwriting on the wall. If you recall, where the one King Belshazzar, I believe his name was, was throwing a huge party. And this king was so arrogant. He was so arrogant that he went on ahead and said, Hey, grab those drinking vessels that we took from the temple. Remember that Jewish temple? Grab those drinking vessels and, and let's, let's drink out of those. And as they were drinking out of those, all of a sudden a hand appeared and started writing on the wall. And it was terrifying. It was many, many temple of Harzim was the words that were written. And he grabbed all of his astrologers, all of his wise men. What does this mean? What does this mean? And Daniel had to come and interpret what the handwriting meant. And basically, what the handwriting was saying is, you're out of time. Your kingdom's going to be overthrown. The Medes and the Persians are coming in. That very night, the Medes and the Persians came in and overthrew Babylon. So individuals, were, are, some are hearing this and being like, well, that didn't free them from the exile. Well, it was actually through the Medes and the Persians that God allowed them to return back to Jerusalem. So once again, they were redeemed from the Babylonians by their own ransom. It was at the cost of the Babylonians. That was the price that was paid. So we're hearing a lot of this redemption being in captivity and then a price that was being paid and that there needed to be a price to be paid. So we, were, we just got done just reviewing quickly the redemption from Egypt, the redemption from the exile and captivity. But now there's one other redemption I want us to talk about. 
And this is a redemption that's currently going on right now. You see, the redemption from Egypt occurred in the past. The redemption from the exile occurred in the past. The redemption from death is occurring right now. It is recurring right now. The work has already been done, but it's recurring right now. The first part is mankind is into captivity now. We're familiar with this. Genesis chapter 3. They were forbidden to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but yet they ate. They transgressed. And due to that transgression, they were thrown out of the garden forever. Now, when I say captivity, I'm talking about captivity of death. Because now, all of a sudden, since sin has entered, now death has entered. And now we are captive. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Through one man sin entered the world, death entered the world, because all have sinned. And why do I use the term captivity? I get it from Jesus. I trust his words. John 8, verse 34 says, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So when you put those verses together, John 5, 12, and you put the verses together, John 8, 34, we hear, okay, all have sinned, and then Jesus says, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. So now we're a slave to sin. Well, what happens because we're a slave to sin? We can start putting this together. Those who know the Romans Road, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So we're all captive by sin. We're a slave to sin, which means we're a slave to death. We're, we're all destined to die. Now we're speaking of a physical, or we're speaking of a spiritual death right here. But the question is, why the wages of sin is death? I want to look back at a couple scriptures from the Old Testament so we can kind of start getting in our heads what we're, what we're thinking about here. This is talking about a, a blood redeemer, or the blood avenger. But here in the, uh, Numbers 35, Verses 31 through 33 says this. <clears throat> Remember, we're talking about redemption and the ransom, the price to be paid. Moreover, you shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. You shall take no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the priest. So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land. That means the blood of the one who was murdered. And no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. That was a law that was talking about if a man murdered, his blood had to be called for. There was no atonement. You see, there was no other ransom. You couldn't put a lamb out. He couldn't pay with the ransom of a lamb. He couldn't pay with the ransom of, of an ox. But it was his blood because he was the one guilty of murder. He was the one guilty of committing the death. So he, his blood, had to be the ransom. Well, when you start putting this together and you see that all have sinned, we are the cause of our own spiritual death. Through the sin of Adam, through that carnal nature that came in, and as we recall in Numbers, what we just read, he who is responsible, it's his blood that's going to have to be required. And so that's how come for our redemption, it should be our blood. 
It should be our blood that is spilled on that cross. But now listen to the cries that are heard. And what I like about this is it's the cry in response to a conviction. And what I mean by conviction is when the Holy Spirit finally talks to you, and you finally understand exactly where you're standing. One of the cries I like, I hear from Paul in Romans. In Romans 7.24, I'll get back to Acts here, but in Romans 7.24, Paul's cry is this, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I want to read a couple verses before that, starting in 21. It says, I find then a law that evil is present within me, the one who wills to do good. You see, I understand now that I'm a slave to sin. I understand I'm a slave to death, and I want to break out of this bondage. But, but I can't. I can't break out of this bondage, what he's saying. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And this is where he cries out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He says, I want to serve God, but I'm in bondage to sin. I'm in bondage. No matter what I do, I can't break this. No matter how many lambs were sacrificed, no matter how many oxen or, or heifers were sacrificed, I can't break this law of sin. This, 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 I'm a slave to it. I'm a slave to it. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. We need redeemed. We can't do it ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. You see, when we look back at the scripture, we start seeing how Israel was redeemed from Egypt at the cost of Egypt, and how Israel was redeemed from Babylon at the cost of Babylon. But this is different. This is different. We need redeemed from sin. We need redeemed from death. That's our own doing. We're the ones that committed sin. It's in us. How can we get it out from us? Number said, blood, blood needs to be shed. Only blood can atone. The blood of the one that committed the murder. The blood of the one. So do you understand? And, and the reason I'm going into this is something that we're kind of all, we hear about all the time, and we acknowledge it, and we understand that we need Christ's blood applied to us. But I want us to really kind of get in why we need Christ's blood, and why it actually should be us in that cross. And the reason why is, it's our sin. It's our, we're the reason we cause a death. We should be the ones being put to death. Yeah. Acts 2. 37 is the cry. If you recall, after Pentecost, when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden he had this tenacity to preach, like never before. And the Holy Spirit filled him, and he gave the best sermon. And he called them out. You are the ones who, who crucified this Messiah. You're the ones who crucified the Christ. And finally, when they were convicted, and that's what I said, the response to conviction, the cry of when they were convicted, they cried out, and they said, as it says, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to their innermost being, the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? It was a cry of, oh, wretched man that we are, what are we to do about this? Well, let's hear about the redemption. We hear about the redemption, and I just put up, I mean, you can find it all over the New Testament, but I love these two verses. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You see, the transgression of the law equals death. That's the curse of it. But he redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law demanded death. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
That's being taken directly out of Deuteronomy 21. Remember where I was talking about the murder and the blood that was applied? Listen, if a man has committed a sin deserving death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged on is cursed of God. Whoever committed a sin worthy of death. Sin is the wages. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. It should have been us on that tree. It should have been our blood that's being spilt with the whips and the, and the thorns and the spear. It should have been our blood to atone for ourselves. But instead, Christ came. Amen. Christ came in. That's how come we can say we have redemption through his blood. What was the price, the ransom? His blood. Now, I'm not talking like a little vial of blood. I'm talking about his life. We read in Matthew, well, I'm jumping ahead on that one, but I'm going to read real quick Ephesians 1.7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Once again, his blood is the ransom. Amen. We can go to the last slide with the last two verses. In him we have redemption through his blood. That's the ransom. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Not to give a part of his life, or just a little bit of it, but he gave his life. Amen. You see, what I'm talking about when I say redeemed by the ransom. Israel in Egypt was redeemed at the cost of Egypt. Israel in Babylon was redeemed at the cost of Babylon. But this redemption demanded blood. Because to be redeemed from death, blood was spilled, we have to have be atoned by the blood. And it should have been our blood. But no. God loved us so much that he redeemed us through his son, which if you've been here on Wednesdays, then I see Creed, very God of very God, his own likeness. We were redeemed through God's Son, through his blood. Through his blood. Not our blood. It should have been our blood. But it was through his blood. Amen. This is something that we're aware of and we hear of. But I just really wanted to break it down because I don't know how much we actually, and, and preaching to myself, like I always do, I don't know how much we actually think about that or grasp it. Because when we start singing the songs, I will sing of my Redeemer. How on the cruel cross he suffered. That should have been us. That should have been us. But it wasn't. Because Christ was perfect. Amen. And he was able to be the propitiation. He stood in. And we hear the, the verse, no greater love hath man than this than lay down his life for a friend. Yes. That's what Christ did for you and I. Christ is the ransom. He is the redeemer and the ransom. So we all praise God. Amen. We serve an awesome God, don't we not? Yes. Amen. Nancy, would you come up? Uh, let's go ahead and just sing the song that we play for our offertory, 308. Uh, if you have your hymn book, go ahead and open to page 308. And in closing, let's just praise our Redeemer. But think of this. We should have been on that cross. But no. Christ's body was our ransom. His blood was the ransom that cleanses us. And as we sing this song, there is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. We are thanking God our Father for giving us His Son and leaving His Spirit so the work on earth is done. 
Would you stand with me as we sing this in closing? Send your son. Amen. Father, the ransom for our redemption, Amen. the price Amen. for our freedom. So, Father, we no longer have to be slaves to sin, which leads to death. But, Father, we are free to obey you, to obey righteousness. Father, I pray that you would just put that desire in our heart to be a slave to righteousness, to be a slave to you, Father, because you paid the ultimate price through Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we come before you today, and we acknowledge, and we celebrate, and we praise you for what you have done. And so, Father, I pray that you just come into our hearts, fill us, Father, with a zeal for holiness, with a zeal to worship you, and, Father, with a zeal to share the story of the redeemed by the ransom with others around us, that we can share the love of the gospel. We praise you, and we thank you, Father, for what you have done. God, be with us now. Put a hedge of protection around each and every one of us. Father, keep us safe and help us just to serve you. We love you and praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord, dismiss.